So now we're moving on to part two of this video, of this lesson, I should say. We just uh, witnessed a chemical reaction which got very cold, so cold that it uh, froze the the water. Well, you had a beaker sitting on a block. There's a block here, and there was water in this layer right here. We'll make it blue because water, of course, is blue. All right, so the water froze um, the beaker. Uh, it froze so that the beaker was attached to the block, or the block was attached to the beaker. So it's a very endothermic reaction. Energy was going in. And we talked about uh, there was a huge increase in enthalpy, or excuse me, entropy here because we're going from solids to gases and liquids and aqueous. So according to the two trends in nature, this reaction actually went toward higher energy. So that was against the trend because we had to put energy into it. So we ended higher than we started. That's a, a kind of a weird thing. Um, but we know that it happened because the disorder trend was favorable. So it was very favorable for it to become more disorderly, and so that caused the reaction to occur on its own. So I don't know if you realize it or not, but what we really saw was uh, something spontaneously going to a higher energy state, which is kind of weird. Um, when I was a young man, you know, someone told me once that there were signs around the mountains um, that said, watch for falling rock, because... Uh, they said there was a, a little boy that was lost, but that's not really the case. <laughs> what it turns out was that they're, they're, you're watching for rocks that might roll down to hills. But you know, when you're driving through the mountains, you never see a sign that says, watch for jumping rocks. It's always falling rocks. So why don't we see a sign that says, watch for jumping rocks? Well, it's because rocks don't jump. So it's very unusual for something to go from a low energy state to a high energy state spontaneously. Spontaneous means on its own. So why would something go to a higher energy state? Well, it has to do with this, this trend in the universe called entropy. So the two trends um, can, be, can, can work together to determine if a chemical reaction will be able to be used to do work. So I'm going to uh, share an equation with you developed by an American physicist named Josiah Gibbs. And he gets a, uh, he's credited for creating a concept called Gibbs free energy, which has that um, mathematical formula. So the delta H means change in enthalpy. Enthalpy, once again, is heat content. And the delta S means change in entropy. And T is temperature in Kelvin. It has to be Kelvin because that, there are no negative numbers on the Kelvin scales. On the Kelvin scale. So no has to be, the temperature must be in Kelvin. And while I'm uh, at this point, let me just talk about units for a moment. Entropy is usually given in joules per mole Kelvin. Because temperature would affect the entropy, the warmer temperature would create a higher entropy, and a cooler temperature would, would create a lower entropy because more disorder would come when the, when the molecules are hotter, they're moving faster. And the change in enthalpy is usually measured in kilojoules per mole. So when you do calculations with this equation, the units have to match. Just be aware of that. Okay, so four scenarios I'm going to lay out, and we're going to talk about the significance of the four scenarios. So scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, and scenario four. <coughs> All right, scenario one I'm going to lay out would be matching our top equation up here. And I'm going to make this just a little bit smaller so I can get more on my screen. So if you look at the top equation, uh, we know that energy was released. So that would be exothermic. And the entropy was increasing because we're going from solid and aqueous to um, aqueous, excuse me, solid and aqueous to aqueous and gas. So entropy would be increasing. Uh, scenario number two, we've got uh, enthalpy change. The change in enthalpy will be positive because it was endothermic. But the entropy um, was also increasing, so that would be a positive positive. And then there are a couple other scenarios you could have. You could have a um, negative negative, or you could have a positive and a negative. So those are your four possible scenarios uh, for chemical reactions or one in scenario one, enthalpy would be decreasing, so it's exothermic, and entropy could be increasing. 
All right, and in scenario two, you, uh, you got both increasing, scenario three, both decreasing, and scenario four, the enthalpy is increasing and the entropy is decreasing. All right, a couple of comments about delta G. Delta G is free energy. Free energy kind of means energy that can be used to do something. It's free and you can use it. Okay, reactions are, uh, free energy can, can be then used to do work. An example of that would be burning gasoline releases free energy and we use the free energy to make our cars move. All right, so now if delta G, whoops, that was a weird looking eye, wasn't it? If delta G is negative, This is a big point. Reactions. Once again, that's if. Reactions are spontaneous. Spontaneous means that they will occur on their own. Now, you got to remember that reactions don't start until you provide the activation energy. So I would say that burning a match is spontaneous, and you might say, well, wait, you have to strike the match. Then I would say yes, but once it starts, it provides its own activation energy and keeps going. So you have to put in activation energy in, but once it starts, it continues on, and it uh, will continue until the fuel is gone. So that's what spontaneous means. It occurs on its own. It doesn't mean that it's fast. Um, examples would be uh, a match, match burning is fast, and... Um, Rusting is slow, but both are spontaneous. When a piece of metal rusts, it takes a long time, but it still uh, occurs on its own. All right, so now we want to look at the four scenarios. I would like to know which one of these scenarios is always going to be a spontaneous, going to result in a spontaneous reaction. And since we're in a video, I won't take a lot of time to give you pause for a minute and think about that. Now, Hopefully you paused and you're back. So in this case, if I have a negative number minus a positive number, I would get it always negative. I'll make a little column here for delta G. So always negative. If I have a positive number and a positive number, now I've got, an, uh, suppose that was 10. 10 minus 5 would create a positive delta G. 10 minus 15 would create a negative delta G. So we would have to say sometimes delta G is negative. Here we've got negative and negative. So if I have, once again using numbers, if I had 10 minus um, a negative 5, that would be 15. That'd be or negative 10 minus and minus 5 would be negative 5, I guess. Negative 10 minus and minus 5 is negative 5. But if that was 15, then it would be positive. So again, we have to say sometimes negative. And down here, we've got a positive number minus a negative number. So a positive number minus a negative number. is always positive. All right, now let's think about it in the context of the trends. So delta H is going down. Is that a trend? Yes. So obey, obey, always negative. It means you can always use that reaction to do work. Doesn't obey, does obey. So you, sometimes you'll get a negative delta G. Obeys, does not obey the trend. So sometimes, again, negative delta G can be negative and the reaction will be spontaneous. And if it's positive here, that does not obey the trend, and this does not obey the trend. So delta G is always positive, which means it'll never be spontaneous. So never spontaneous. Okay, so we've got an always, Sometimes, sometimes, and never for the four different scenarios that you could have. So let's look at a couple of examples um, of how those scenarios play out. 
So you remember this graph. If you're going this way, that would be called melting. Okay, so if you're melting something, let's write our equation down, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. If you're melting things, you have to put energy in to break the bonds. So that would be an endothermic process. But as the bonds break, do the molecules get more or less disorderly? Well, they get, they get more disorderly because you're breaking the bonds. They start moving around more, so the entropy is positive. So that would be delta G is sometimes negative, or sometimes this reaction will happen spontaneously. I'd like to think about under what temperature conditions does melting happen. Does it melt at high temperature, or do you think, does ice melt at high temperature or low temperature? Well, I think ice melts at high temperature. And that would make sense if we just made up some numbers here. If that was, say, 10, and this was 5, 10 minus 5 is 5. But if I could make this get bigger, 10 minus 15 would be negative 5. And that would make delta, delta G become negative. So the bigger this number is, the more negative delta G will be. So if you have positive and positive for the two trends, the reaction will be spontaneous at high temperature. Now, I think that relates to your everyday experience because you know that ice melts when it's warm outside. Now, if you're going to go the other way, so delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, and we, put it, we say that delta H is going to be negative in this case because if you're going from liquid to solid, the molecules got to, got to slow down so they'll have less energy. So you could say that the uh, delta H is negative. And the entropy is, if we're going from liquid down to solid, they're going to be becoming more structured or less disordered. So as you go this way, right to left, it'll be less disordered, that'd be negative also. So negative minus negative, well, it depends on, is it going to be a negative delta G well, it depends on the magnitude of the number. So, for example, if this was negative 10 and this was uh, negative 5, negative 10 minus a minus 5 is negative 5. So, yeah, you're negative. But if this becomes negative 15, negative 10 minus a minus 15 is positive 5. So, in order for this to be spontaneous, we need to keep this number smaller. And the smaller number requires a lower temperature. So, this reaction. This process would be spontaneous at low temperatures. Now, what do you want to do when you want to freeze water? Don't you put it in your freezer, which has a low temperature, and so the water freezes spontaneously. All right, so that's an example of um, the sometimes scenarios that we had right here, sometimes, sometimes. All right, one more uh, example set. So now I want to look at a chemical reaction that you're familiar with probably. Uh, C6H12O6, that's blood sugar. We combine it with oxygen. We exhale carbon dioxide. Water is a product. We excrete that. Um, there's your balanced chemical equation. Where would energy go in this equation? So let's, let's make our... Uh, delta H minus T delta S, and that's equal to delta G. So where would energy go in this reaction? Well, if you feel your forehead, you'll find that your temperature is warmer than the room around you. So that means that uh, energy is being released as you digest your food, and that's what this chemical reaction is. is. It's a summary of what we call in science cellular respiration, or just digestion of your food. And it releases energy. That's why you have a body temperature. So this would be an exothermic process. Delta H would be negative. Um, the states of matter, that'd be solid. That'd be gas. That'd be gas. That would be uh, liquid. So you can see that entropy is increasing because you're going from a solid and a gas to a liquid and a gas. So entropy is increasing, you have a positive there. So now you got a negative number minus a positive number. See, that matches this one. Negative number minus a positive number is always spontaneous. So you don't have to do anything to digest your food. It just happens. 
because you got enough energy in your body right now to get the reaction started. You just keep eating food and the food uh, picks up the activation energy and, and the whole process goes to completion. Now, of course, it's really, this is a bunch of chemical reactions all summarized into one reaction. We won't get into that here. All right, the other, if you wrote the reaction the other way around, so we have the, the uh, six CO2 plus the six waters, This is gas, this is solid, this is liquid, this is gas. So what is um, happening to the entropy in this direction? We'll see how I reversed equations, the equation. So this equation is the reverse of this one. So that's gonna change both of my signs. That's gonna make the delta H become positive and the T delta S become negative. So you see neither trend is being obeyed. And this reaction will be never spontaneous. And this reaction will be always spontaneous. Last point. Is it the case then that a, that a never spontaneous reaction will not occur? Or does this reaction actually occur? Well, when no heat goes over here. All right, because it's endothermic, it's the opposite of this. So this reaction never is spontaneous but yet it occurs all the time. This is called photosynthesis. Now you know that plants absorb light, and when they absorb light, they make sugar, then we can eat the sugar and take it back into this equation. Carbon dioxide and water come back into this equation, make the sugar again, it's like a little cycle. All right, but it's not spontaneous. So delta G is always positive, but yet it occurs. So is it possible to make a non-spontaneous reaction occur? Yes, as long as you provide energy. So if you think about plants, when you put a, a flower in a closet, it dies because there's no light. But as long as it has a regular supply of light, then this reaction will occur and the plant is able to sustain um, its life. And it goes ahead and provides oxygen, which of course is good for the environment, which we, we want. That's why you should, people say plant trees and so on, because yeah, this is a desirable reaction. All right, so is it possible to make a non-spontaneous reaction occur? Yes, but you have to provide energy. Another example would be charging your cell phone. Uh, cell phones spontaneously discharge, but in order to get them to go back, you have to recharge them. You have to put energy in continually. Okay, summary of what we've said. This is the whole, all the stuff I've talked about in these two lessons, or the two parts of this one lesson. Two trends in the universe. A trend toward lower energy, which we call the enthalpy trend, or heat content, it tends to get less. Also, there's another trend toward more disorder. Did a little experiment to show you um, an endothermic um, process that is spontaneous. Talked about, wow, that's weird because it's like a rock jumping up a hill. You gain energy spontaneously. How can that happen? But it happens because of the entropy trend. We looked at four scenarios for free energy. Free energy is the energy that's used to do work. If delta G is negative, that means free energy is released. The reactions are spontaneous. So if delta G is negative, energy released, the reaction is spontaneous. All right, so four scenarios we looked at where both trends are being obeyed will always be spontaneous, where neither trend is being obeyed will never be spontaneous. But once again, does it, is it true that the non-spontaneous reaction cannot occur? No, you can make it occur. You just have to put energy in all the time. Then we looked at one being obeyed and the other not in two different scenarios. And we found out that this type of reaction will the sometimes means it's spontaneous at high temperatures. And then the sometimes on the other scenario meant spontaneous at low temperatures. Then we looked at two reactions that you're familiar with, cellular respiration, where uh, you're digesting your food, and that's an always spontaneous process because both trends are being obeyed. We looked at photosynthesis as a never spontaneous process because neither trend is being obeyed. However, you can make it occur if you put in energy, and that's what light does for photosynthesis. All right. And then um, one last closing thought. Back when we talked about enthalpy in previous videos, we said that the heat content of free elements is zero. 
entropy of free elements is only zero at zero K. So there, uh, when you're doing entropy calculations, you'll always have to use um, an actual entropy value. And remember, uh, I mentioned this here, that the units need to match when you do calculations to this equation. All right, so that's the end of, of part two to this lesson. And I'll come back in later uh, with a little bit of a math explanation, how you do math with, this, with these formulas.